Welcome to the Vet Me Rehabilitation Podcast, where we aim to help fellow Vet Me rehab therapists increase their knowledge and elevate their practice. I'm Megan Kelly. And I'm Anae Lloyd. Together, we bring you the latest insights, research, and information in the field of veterinary rehabilitation. This podcast is brought to you by Online Pet Health, a leading continued education membership for veterinary rehabilitation therapists. With Online Pet Health, you'll have access to a wide range of online resources to help you stay up to date with the latest techniques, advances, and trends in the industry. Our podcast features in-depth conversations with leading experts in veterinary rehabilitation. They share their own experiences and knowledge to help you improve your practice. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out in the field, our goal is to provide you with the tools and the insights you need to succeed. So join us as we explore the exciting world of vet knee rehabilitation and help you take your practice to the next level. Hey vet rehabbers, if you've been a long time listener, you will know that every year we hold an online conference in November. Now, the first one was in 2017 and so this year we are hosting our 7th Vet Rehab Summit. So we are all familiar with the concept of tensegrity and the intricate connections of the different structures of the body to one another. So this year, the Vet Rehab Summit focuses on furthering our understanding of these connections and interactions through the understanding of the myofascial kinetic chains within the canine and equine body. The Vet Rehab Summit 2023 will be a two-day live event welcoming lecturers and researchers Vipke Elbrand and Rick Schultz. They're going to share their extensive knowledge and research both on equine and canine myofascial lines. And it's going to be an awesome, awesome day. We'd love to have you there. The dates are the 10th and the 11th of November. Now, on our Pet Health paid members, you guys get complimentary VIP access to the Vet Rehab Summit. Non-members are able to purchase access to the event. Early bird tickets are now open, so you can go to vetrehabsummit.com and you can save yourself $200. Today, I speak to Andrew Armitage about using regenerative medicine in elbow dysphagia cases. Andrew explains why these cases don't do well with the traditional conservative and surgical treatments. We also discuss a really interesting find of his, and what he noticed is that those of the cases that did have surgery actually later on had more severe arthritis than the ones that didn't have. So before we head over to the interview, a quick word from our sponsor. Paul Prosper believes true pet well-being demands a three-pronged approach, prevention, support, and rehabilitation. Their brands are trusted by veterinarians, universities, and rehab facilities alike. Whether you're looking to train, rehabilitate, or help your pet age gracefully, their brands like the Help Him Up Harness, Fit Paws, Muffins Halo, and Response System offer effective, innovative, and proven solutions. You can learn more about how Paul Prosper can help pets age gracefully today at paulprosper.com. You can also see Paul Pospa and their brands at this year's Vet Rehab Summit on the 10th and 11th of November. So over to my chat with Andrew. Hey, Andrew, thank you so much for joining me again. Thank you for inviting me to, to join you. It's a pleasure. Now for the listeners, we, uh, Andrew and I have actually did a podcast just a few weeks ago and we were talking about regenerative medicine in Cristillus contractors. And during our conversation, he started chatting about elbow dysplasia and um, he said, well, now that's a whole other topic for another podcast. So I jumped on it and I said, okay, Angie, let's make that another podcast. So here we are today. Angie, before we chat it about, start chatting about regenerative medicine for elbow dysplasia, could you just tell the listeners um, just about yourself and how you got into regenerative medicine? Yeah, of course. So I'm Andy Armitage and I work at Greenside Veterinary Practice based in the Scottish Borders. I'm a, a clinical director and I specialize in regenerative medicine. So, yeah, I guess it's nearly 10 years ago now that I started regenerative medicine and treatments uh, in my patients. It was really started when I was using laser therapy. So I was one of the earlier doctors in the UK of laser therapy, fast ball laser therapy, and I was seeing such you know, amazing results with this, um, yeah, pain management, but also wound healing, things like that. And I just got interested to understand what was happening. And that research led me down the route of stem cell therapy and how laser therapy activates stem cells. And it was shortly after that sort of research um, that I met a couple of directors from a company called Cell Therapy Sciences 
that we're setting up a, a lab in the UK to start culturing stem cells for uh, for dogs and cats. And we yeah started collaborating and 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 started what they wanted to do is look at tissue samples for, that contain stem cells and how to ship those to the lab and the the, the culturing processes um, involved. So. I started sending them um, bits of fat that were left over from bitch spays that would have ended up in the bin, obviously with client consent, to explore how these these samples transported and, and how we could extract the stem cells from these samples. And yeah, as a as a thank you, you know, once they had done their initial research and optimized their protocols, they gave me five cases free of charge of stem cell cultures. So I picked my five worst arthritic patients um, and uh, convinced the owners to try this novel technology, stem cells, and they were all very excited about it. And I treated treated the five cases, and I was just absolutely blown away by the, the responses that I was seeing. And the rest is history. And now I, I opened the first regenerative medicine uh, rehabilitation referral center in the UK. And that's what I do 100% of the time now. Thanks, Edgy. Yeah, I'm excited to chat about albodysplasia because it's one of those conditions where, you know, we try so many different things, but we don't often get the outcomes that we are hoping for. And I know when we chatted last time, you said that albodysplasia was actually one of the cases that you see most often for regenerative medicine. Yeah, that's that's true. It's there, there seems to be a, a pandemic of elbow dysplasias, and uh, it accounts for probably about 70% of my workload and we see a lot of Labradors and, and certainly that breed is, is overrepresented. And, uh, you know, I realized early on that these cases were incredibly challenging. Uh, and I think, you know, the elbow joint is a, is a very complex joint. It's, you think of it as a simple hinge joint, but it's, it's one of the most complex joints in, in the body. And elbow dysplasia is an umbrella term for a lot of different things that can happen uh, in, in the elbow. So started calling it elbow developmental disease. And we can have things like osteochondrosis, uh, fragmented coronoid process uh, problems, medial compartment disease, ununited anconeal process. And we can have these, these different conditions in combination or, or on their own. And it so there's a lot of different things that can go wrong developmentally with the elbow. But I think the main problem is, is that that results in arthritis and the, the long-term management of these cases is, is difficult because we, we inevitably get end-stage arthritis in these, in these joints, whether they're treated conservatively or, or, or with surgery. And it's really, the, in my opinion, the arthritis that we need to, need to focus on. Yeah, I think one thing that you said is really important, you know, because often when we do surgeries, we hope to slow down that progression or decrease the chance of getting arthritis. But I think one of the things is, is even if albert dysplasias have surgery, we still end up with usually quite severe arthritis. We're never, ever going to not um, have some arthritis and pain in that joint. Have you found that too? Yes, for sure. So, you know, it seems whatever you do, it's you're trying to slow down the arthritis or, or, or prevent the severity, but you cannot stop it. You know, there's the all the conditions that affect the elbow with, with dysplasia result in, in cartilage jet damage or joint microinstability that damages the cartilage and, and arthritis always develops. And there's there's a number of different surgical techniques out there. And that's because there's a lot of different things that can happen in the elbow, but also, you know, people are trying different procedures to try and get better outcomes. And really, I guess for end stage arthritis and elbow replacement would be ideal, but unfortunately we're not there with the technology yet. And there's, there's a lot of complications with these and, um, yeah, I, it's not currently recommended. Uh, you know, you look at the the hips with hip dysplasia. We've got great implants, great success with with hip replacements in dogs, but with elbows, that's that's not the case. 
Yeah, so Albert dysplasia seems like, you know, one of those conditions that doesn't respond so well to traditional approaches that, that vets have used. Why do you think this is compared to other, you know, if there's arthritic in, say, a hip or in a knee? Well, I think it's the complexity of the of the joint and the presence of, uh, you know, various pathologies going on in there. And it's 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 difficult because you know this presents in young dogs uh, normally about yeah six to nine months and and I guess there's two cohorts of, of cases where we get early early lameness and then um, you know there's potential interventions early on before the arthritis develops but a lot of these these dogs have intermittent lameness that maybe isn't diagnosed. And um, and then it's really when they get to sort of two and three years old that they they're really struggling and and then you know you've got end stage arthritis or advanced arthritis and that's that's difficult to then to then manage and what I've also found with elbow dysplasia is a very very high concurrent shoulder tendinopathies with these cases and I think you know these have gone unnoticed because you can't diagnose them with, with radiography usually or ct i do a lot of musculoskeletal ultrasound for these these dogs and we we look at the the shoulder tendons and it's over 90 percent of dogs with elbow dysplasia have concurrent shoulder tendinopathies and i think you know these dogs that we're managing the arthritis and then we have a deterioration it's because we're getting concurrent shoulder tendinopathies and it can be difficult to decide that is it the elbow is it the shoulder or is it both that's that's contributing to the pain and lameness so i think yeah we need to we need to use ultrasound more to evaluate the shoulders where we've got cases of elbow dysplasia and i think that the shoulder tendon tendinopathies occur because we get restricted range of motion in the elbow the biceps obviously crosses the elbow and the shoulder controls the the, the movement of, of both joints and, and and dogs with elbow dysplasia often have a lot of pain on the medial compartment and that tends to sort of ro- outwardly rotate those elbows uh, and it affects the gait and as soon as you do that and they start walking a bit like a bulldog um, that changes the angulation of the shoulder and the pull of the tendons and that can result in repetitive strain on, on these tendons and uh, on that contributes to to the lameness so uh you know it can start involving other other joints and of course obviously you know you get offloading uh onto the back end and that can put excessive you know pressure on the spine and and hind limb joints as they as they compensate um that can result in problems elsewhere as well in labrador's hip dysplasia is is common um as well and i see a lot of dogs with concurrent hip dysplasia and then you're really struggling because you've got potentially four limbs that are, are causing pain and trying to trying to compensate and that complicates the, the clinical picture as well yeah i think those shoulder injuries you know sometimes just on on um Clinical, you know, when you when we're just palpating and manipulating, it's very difficult to isolate where the pain's coming from. You know, if it's the if it's the elbow or the shoulder, yeah. uh, so those shoulder compensatory injuries, I'm sure, play a big part of it. And I, you, you said eighty percent of the cases that you see have got compensate ninety percent plus ninety really. Wow. And you know, I'm I'm using ultrasound, which is a really really sensitive. I'm not saying all of these have got you know mineralized tendons or um, but you know, you will always find some degree of pathology there, either with the tendon in thesis or the tendon itself, and that can be yeah, uh, anything from sort of core lesions, inflammation to sort of end stage mineralizations in the in the biceps or, or supraspinatus more more commonly. And when you're evaluating the biceps, it's it's difficult because the biceps tendon stretch test what you're doing is flexing the shoulder fully and then extending the elbow and if you're getting pain there is it from full elbow extension or is it from stretching the the bicep so that that can be difficult to um and you assume it's from from the elbow but it may not be it may be shoulder as well and the 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 biceps and supraspinatus glide over each other even though the biceps is within the joint and the supraspinatus is without that inside the joint, 
they they do um, sort of articulate uh, or glide over each other. So if you get uh, swelling in one, that can put pressure on on the other, and it's it's very common to see pathology in both of those tendons. So oh, so interesting. And can you run through and um, maybe using a case that you've treated um, with elbow dysplasia, your approach to these cases? What I would ideally like to do is is treat all of these cases at initial diagnosis with um, stem cells and PRP. And but it's 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 difficult to 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 get those cases early on because I think we can intervene early on we can actually prevent the arthritis from from developing and certainly slow its progression so as i said the 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 main aim is to to address the the arthritis so i see a variety of cases from cases that have just been diagnosed and that the owners are are not sure or, or don't want to proceed with a more invasive option like surgery and i also see cases that have had surgeries and and then you know we see them later on when they're still lame or or, or the lameness has returned and they're, they're struggling. So I see uh, a variety of cases and I've I've treated them all with regenerative medicine. So we we harvest fat, um, which is a small incision uh, just above the umbilicus, and, and take the fasciform back because that's got the highest concentration of stem cells in well within any tissue in the body, the fascicle fat's got the, the most stem cells, surprisingly. And uh, we send that off to, to the lab where they, they culture the number of cells that we need in, in the volume appropriate for, for the dog. And then those are shipped back to me uh, in practice where we can then store them in our minus 80 freezer because they're cryogenically stored. And then we defrost those and make platelet-rich plasma patient side by taking a blood sample and using the centrifuge to spin that down and concentrate the platelets. And I combine the stem cells and PRP together and inject it into all areas of pathology. So if we've got elbow dysplasia or arthritis, it goes in the elbows. If we've got current shoulders, it goes in the shoulders. Um, So it's a very targeted treatment and we have to identify all areas of pathology to get the best results and treat all of those um, concurrently. So as I say, I've been doing it for, for 10 years and over over the last 10 years, I've, I've changed the way I do things and I've, I've seen I've seen some interesting findings uh, when we come to treat with regenerative medicine. So one of the, the things that I'm seeing is, is dogs that have had surgeries and then uh, they present to me after that maybe you know months or years after after those surgeries when we come to treat those cases with regenerative medicine they're a lot more challenging than if there hasn't been any surgical interventions and we've had to modify our protocols and hit these dogs um harder with with regenerative therapies so higher cell numbers repeat treatments to get sort of approaching that the same response so if I see if I see a dog that hasn't had surgical intervention, got arthritis, we can normally treat um, as as a single injection and with stem cells and PRP. And those dogs do well for about eighteen months to two years following the treatment. And then over time, because we're not growing a new elbow, what we're doing is turning back the clock in that joint. So we're addressing the pain, the inflammation, growing new cartilage getting better range of motion in the joint and just settling things down so it's a, a management tool it's not a, it's not a cure and what we found is yeah we can arrest the development of, of arthritis and just stop it but it's not it's not going to la- last the lifetime for the patient so after about 18 months to two years then we have to top these dogs up but we've got stem cells that are cryogenically stored at the lab and we can just wake those up and uh, culture some more cells without having to repeat fat harvest. And then, you know, I've treated some dogs now through the course of their life, and I've seen that, you know, every 18 months, two years, we top up, we get, you know, a response again, and they do well for another 18 months to two years before we have to, we have to repeat. And when we do repeat diagnostics, 
you know, we we are seeing that the the disease is not progressing as as expected. It's it's really slowed down. But then, you know, these dogs with that have had surgeries, especially arthroscopy, where the fragmented coronoid process is removed and, and the cartilage is curetted out, those um, those cases you have to hit harder, treat them twice, three months apart. We have to add in things like hyaluronic acid to our stem cells and, and PRP. And those cases, you know, will go on for like 12 months to 15 months before they need a top up. And we've managed to push that a bit further with more intensive treatments. Um, but there's, there's still that difference. And that's interesting to me. And if you look at the... Uh, there's a couple of papers recently that they've they've looked at one group of dogs with uh, fragmented coronal process and or two groups with fragmented coronal process and cartilage damage, and they've looked at arthroscopic intervention and conservative management in in two groups and followed those out. And, and what those two studies showed is after two years there was no difference in the in the groups, and that goes back to development of, of arthritis and and maybe removing the fragmented coronary process and curating out the cartilage is not what we should be doing and and I it's quite controversial but I certainly believe that stem cell therapy early on well at any stage but if we can get these dogs early on before any any surgical interventions they they will do better than if they had surgery it's really interesting. So do you, so what you're thinking is that those cases that have had surgery, their arthritis is so and much more severe and that's why you have to do the treatments um, more often. I, I, I think so. Yes. And, and certainly, you know, I see a lot of dogs um, that have had surgeries before a year old and I see them maybe at three years old and, uh, and they, they seem to have worse arthritis than, than dogs that haven't had, had surgery is progressing over the same time and a classic example was a case where it was actually two two brothers uh two labradors and they were littermate uh brothers and one of them presented with uh with yeah uh a left forelimb lameness and and that dog went to went for ct scan was diagnosed with elbow uh, dysplasia had arthroscopy and fragmented fissure in the fragmented coronary process um, and that was removed and the cartilage was um, curetted out the right elbow wasn't as bad but there was still a well, there was a fissure I think on the left it was a fragmented coronary process on the right it was a, a fissure so they had they'd done arthroscopy on the left um, and the plan was to then uh, stage it and do arthroscopy on, on the right at a later date and that dog didn't do very well after surgery. The the lameness was was actually worse, and the dog really struggled. And then yeah, it came to see me, and uh, we went down the regenerative medicine route. So I treated both elbows uh, with stem cells and PRP, and uh, and followed that dog over over a number of years. And and it was interesting where we started off with you know similar pathology, maybe less severe in the right, but the the, the arthritis on the right wasn't um, wasn't advanced and at all. It was sort of, you know, grade one out of five. And we treated, yeah, both elbows with regenerative medicine and, and yeah, the dog improved and did did really well. But the the arthritis, even despite the, the stem cell therapy, um, it did progress quicker on the left than than on the right without surgery. And uh the dog's brother actually was diagnosed with bilateral elbow dysplasia and hip dysplasia as well. And they didn't want to go down the surgical route, so we just treated both elbows with stem cell therapy and, and, and PRP. And, you know, followed these dogs. Now, I treated them maybe that's five years ago. Um, and uh, if you look at the x rays now for the, the dog that didn't have surgery, you know, that arthritis hasn't progressed. And we've still got great two out of five um, arthritis bilaterally. And yeah, the dog that had the surgeries, the 
on the left, the arthritis is far more advanced. Clinically, the dog's doing well and we can control the, the lameness and the pain. But uh, it's just interesting. And that those two cases really sort of cemented in my mind that uh, stem cell therapy should be used first line. Yeah. Well, that's another study for you to do, right? <laughs> well, I'm doing it. <laughs> So um, the study that I, I published, you know, a lot of those cases did have elbow dysplasia and arthritis, but we were looking at you know, various um, musculoskeletal disorders. So I, I'm, I'm currently working through the data. Uh, we've got another about 200 dogs with elbow dysplasia over, um, over a number of years that have been treated you know surgically or or haven't had surgery and then we perform regenerative medicine and we can look in in more depth and i can get you some actual numbers and you know time scales of of, of remission of, of lameness and pain following following treatment but i can tell you now the dogs that have had surgeries do less well yeah and it's really interesting i mean i'd i'd love to be able to see like those two brothers right if you had one that had the surgery and then one that had stem cells straight from the beginning, you know, when they were first diagnosed and then look at them 10 years later and see how they, how they do. You are really interesting. Because yeah, with two brothers, they've got similar genetics and you know, they've got similar problems. The thing I'm always asked is, well, what happens to the fragmented coronoid process or, you know, the, the fissures in that. And I don't know, I can't tell you that because, you know, these dogs do well. Uh, we resolve the pain and lameness, so it's it's difficult to justify, you know, doing a repeat CT scan or repeat arthroscopy to go in there and have a look when these dogs are, you know, clinically clinically well. So I, I don't know. Do do the stem cells heal heal that, you know, or do they just remodel it, or is it just yeah, we're stopping the arthritis and growing a bit more cartilage and making them more comfortable? So. That's that's another study as well, but it's 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 difficult to to justify, as I say, where you've got clinically normal dog, you know, a year after stem cells to you know go down the expense of CTs or putting an arthroscope in there to to have a look. So interesting, Andrew. Now, obviously, you've got a clinic that is specifically for rehabilitation and for regenerative medicine. Uh, it's not really that mainstream yet to do regenerative medicine in veterinary practices. I mean, definitely not here in South Africa. What is it like in the UK? Well, again, uh, still, there's a lot of people dabbling in it, but uh, it's it's certainly not it's certainly not common. And uh, you know, I have I have patients traveling from all over the UK um, to me. Many travel, you know, hundreds of miles because you know there's there's nothing local to them. So it's it's still very much in its infancy in, uh, in the UK as well. Why do you think that is? I mean, why do you think that vets haven't adopted this? I mean, considering the results that you're getting now, I mean, you know, with the gracilis contractures, with, I mean, albedo I mean, we, we're we not really getting those results using the approaches that we, we're used to using. So now we've got something that we can use and we're getting great results. So I think, you know, traditionally it's been lack of evidence and, you know, there's been lots of published research in, in, in stem cells, but it's normally small groups of dogs or not naturally occurring disease processes and things. So so there has been a, a lack of evidence. Hopefully, you know, the paper that I published in, in January goes uh, a long way to, to fill those gaps in the, in the, in the data and you know, can be used to, to promote the use, but it's it's not a it's not a difficult procedure. We're talking about um, joint injections, uh, but I think you know a lot of vets are nervous of, of joint injections and potential complications. But I think you know if you uh, surgically prep these joints and, and 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 use correct techniques, then it's it's very minimally invasive with with a, a very very low complication rate. That word, I've never had a septic arthritis and I've done thousands and thousands of, of joint injections. So it's it's just having the confidence to to do that and also the the, the diagnostics as well. So stem cell therapy, as I say, it's a, a very targeted treatment and we have to treat all areas of pathology, 
to get the best outcome. So if we if we're just focusing on the elbows and treat the elbows, we may get a you know a reasonable response, but it's not going to be it's not going to be great because this dog's got shoulder tendons that you don't know about that are causing a problem. So you know if you treat the elbows and you don't see much difference in the lameness, you you say well regenerative medicine doesn't doesn't really work, but it does. It works in every case if you can identify all areas. And that's, you know, I, we do thorough diagnostic workups and it's, it's very common to find arthritis in other joints to have lump sacral disease or, or spinal problems. Yes, current shoulder or other soft tissue compensatory, repetitive strain type injuries, you know, the, the back end with hip problems and lump sacral disease, we get a lot of iliopsoas tendinopathy. That's another podcast. And uh, we just have to identify it all and treat it. So with shoulders, the biggest problem is is musculoskeletal ultrasound. There's very, very few people that, that do that. And it's uh, in the equine world, it's done all the time. In the small animal world, it's just not done. But uh, there's a lot of interest and it will, it will come. But it, it just takes time. To, it took me five years to to get really good at musculoskeletal ultrasound, and I had to go out to America to get get trained up in it. But now it's invaluable. And when you're dealing with arthritis, it's not just the joints; it's everything else, muscles, tendons, you know, support structures. And you need to identify everything, and then you can target the stem cells and PRP into those areas, and uh, and get an awesome response. And then yes, you know, you're gonna promote regenerative medicine because uh, it has these amazing effects and we can actually reverse pathology within the musculoskeletal system. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. It's to be able to diagnose everything that's going on. And as you say, you know, as an equine practitioner, they're used to doing ultrasound. They ultrasound tendons all the time, but it's not something that we were taught at vet school. I mean, we were taught it in the equine world, but not in the small animal world. So when you become a small animal practitioner, you do abdominal ultrasound, right? That's yeah. what we do. But yeah. for some reason, we just, yeah, haven't focused on doing ultrasound on joints and tendons and in small animals. It's strange. Uh, when I, as you're saying that now, I was thinking like, why? Why did that happen? Why, why are we doing it in horses and not in small animals? And, uh, you know, it's a, a big part of yeah, human uh, medicine as well, you know, yeah. ultrasound. It's, yeah, it's so important because we all rely on x-rays, which is great for arthritis and certain spinal things. But, you know, if, you, if you're looking at soft tissues, it's it's useless unless you've got um, a big mineralized supraspinatus tendon. That's going to show up on x-ray. But, you know, I use ultrasound to... Um, evaluate the hip joint so I can look into the hip joint. You can see if there's a joint infusion, uh, capsular thickening. You can see early osteophytes on the femoral neck. Uh, you can assess the cartilage. I, you know, I even look at the caudal lumbar discs. You can um, scan via the abdomen and look into the caudal lumbar discs and uh, measure the hydration status. You can look for early spondylosis, uh, early disc degeneration. So it's incredibly useful, and yeah, looking at muscles and um, and tendons for yeah, uh, gracilis contracture. It's it's um, ideal for looking at all, all the lesions in, in the muscles and tendons. So it's you know it's something that I use on every patient. Thank you, Andrew. It's been so great chatting to you again, and I absolutely love your passion. You know, as you're talking about. And uh, looking at the discs and how hydrated that I can see in your face, how excited you get about it. So it's clear that you're very passionate about regenerative medicine. And we are very, very grateful that you are sharing your knowledge with us. So thank you for coming on the podcast again. And I am going to take you up on that offer. So the next one will have to be on the idiot so. Okay, perfect. Awesome, Andrew. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about all things vet rehab. A big thanks to our sponsor, Paul Prosper. Their sponsorship allows us to be able to give this podcast to you for free. Please go and check them out. You can go to paulprosper.com. 
Don't forget to bookmark the next Vet Rehab Summit. It's on Friday the 10th and Saturday the 11th of November. Come and be a part of the world's largest online veterinary rehabilitation conference. It's created specifically for you, the Vet Rehabber community. Online Pet Health members, you get VIP complimentary access to the Vet Rehab Summit. For more information and continued education for vet rehabbers, you can go to onlinepethealth.com.